this is why the government says it has not let people back into the villages um, where they belong because you can see that much of the area was mined and so they have people literally coming out and checking all of these different areas in order to make it safe again the government is using all sorts of techniques including these huge machines that beat the earth and set off those mines but the machines are definitely not foolproof, so they also have to send in human beings. We watch this painstaking process. You walk down and there's this gentleman squatting down on the ground, and he's got what amounts to like a metal detector, um, a mine detector, and he's slowly, slowly passing it over, and I'm talking inch by inch. And right as my mind started going there, thinking this is going to take hours, we hear a beeping. But he didn't even have to dig for us to see one. Walking through some of those minefields where they're saying it's, it's safe, it's okay to walk, you, you start in your head going through what happens to someone who steps in a mine, and then the pictures that you see and the people that you meet who have injuries um, from anti-personnel mines. It's not a good feeling. There are an estimated 1.5 million mines and unexploited ordinances around. <laughs> How can you find all these things? Somebody's gonna accidentally miss something. It's just, it seems impossible. As the army put it, the mining that the Tamil Tigers did was very scattered. So there's not necessarily a pattern to where these things are. Landmines have another effect, making it difficult for people to go home. An estimated 280,000 people were displaced by war, forced to live in camps like this one. There are still thousands here. We were hearing that landmines weren't the only thing keeping people in camps. Some people told us they didn't know why they were still there. We went looking for answers, and so just after his election victory, a few international journalists and I were given a rare chance to ask President Mahinda Rajapaksa some questions we wanted to know why there were still so many homeless. Officially, they're called internally displaced persons, or IDPs. Mr. President, what is the status of the IDPs who are still in the camps, and why are they, they still there? They can go. I mean, when, when we clear the whole area, we will slowly settle They have 50,000 people. Or some people have come back. They say, we, have, we are losing these, all these facilities here. But if they, they get there. Food free, they get, they get the shelter, they get water, and they are very happy. They, they, help, they are happy in the camps. But, but sir, if they're so happy in the camps, then why don't you let the independent media go on their own to all of the camps? We're always go. taken to the same one. That's not true. We can't go. We can't go without an army escort. So why don't you just let us go, drive up? and go to the, all the different camps, not the same camp. Yeah, but We're always taken to the same when camp. You all go and make the worst things, so sometimes you make it... Make it uh, uh, We're just going to talk to distorted people. Distorted uh, versions, and we have seen that in the history. It has happened. Take a photograph uh, and say that we have put them in a camp. Barbed by a camp. Well, they were behind barbed wire. I saw it myself. There was barbed wire around the camps. The other looming issue, allegations of war crimes against both sides. We took a look at a U.S. State Department report which details more than 170 incidents. We attempted to speak with leaders of the Tamil Tigers, but most of them have either been captured, killed, or are in hiding. Did the Sri Lankan military commit war crimes? No. How do you know? I knew it. But all the families said they, the firing was 
definitely coming from both sides. So as to an independent investigation, he said, you know, we're looking at doing that. There were allegations of, of bombing just indiscriminately. No. There were allegations. It was all targeted. It was allegations, no, it was targeted when they took the real target. What you take away from talking to different people in different aspects of the war, whether it's the civilians who did not choose to be where they were and got stuck, or members of the military who chose this job, but at a young age had no idea what it was going to mean to them and their families. You come out with the sense that in some ways everybody lost. Which is why the last war victim we met made such an impression on us. She was young and extraordinarily upbeat, despite what the war did to her. And we walked in, and she's sitting on the floor, and she has her skirt on, and sort of covered her legs. And she's sitting sort of like this, and she looks perfectly comfortable, as if she's sort of kneeling on the floor. And then you realize, when she turns her head, that her eye is a glass eye, and that she's not kneeling, she's in fact missing her legs from her knees down. We came running to the bunkers to escape from the shelling. We got into a bunker and the shell fell inside. So my sister-in-law's child died. Me, I lost my two legs. My legs were there, but amputated in the hospital. They were shattered. I just said, you know, well, tell me about what's going on now in your life and how are you handling all this? And she was very upbeat. She was, um, extremely positive and then after the first two questions I asked her how she's going to get along in her life and what her plans are. Before I was injured I had no problems. Now I can't do anything. That is the only problem. There's so many things in her life that she hasn't been able to do, and so many experiences in her life that she hasn't had because she's been living in this nightmare. Oh, it, it is, it makes me angry, and yet this girl was not angry. She was not angry. And I asked her how it is possible for someone in her condition to not be angry at somebody. Whatever happened to me has happened to others. Earlier, I was very angry inside. When I would look at someone, I would feel agitated. There were so many people, somebody without legs, some without hands, some had lost their entire body below their waist. After seeing all that, I consoled myself that I am better off. Her determination and hope seemed to strip away the bitterness of war, but for many, the grieving process is just beginning because now, after so long, they're no longer running for their lives. Now, a different kind of life is beginning and many are simply trying to find the same kind of strength inside themselves that this 21-year-old young woman has already discovered. <laughs>